What does it all mean? This is where the archaeology has been found. Oh, hi, how are you? Look at that. I, I need a, a planter. A shrine to a belly button. Is it a rock of salt? Look at that. No one gets into this place. No one. Nice. Whoa, don't take me too far. Now that's naked archaeology. You wouldn't think that in a wine store, you can actually come up with a biblical mystery. To everyone else, this is just a cigar. To me, it's a bit of archaeology. The guy who came up with the idea, Sigmund Freud, that this thing isn't just a cigar. Well, this is not exactly a cigar. He also had an idea about Moses. You know Moses, who parted the sea, who led the Israelites out of Egypt. He says that Moses isn't the big shot that the Bible says he is. He said, no, Moses wasn't a follower of God. He was a follower of a pharaoh named Akhenaten. When Akhenaten got kicked out, Moses took all the slaves, ran out, and he was really setting up Akhenatonism. Akhenatonism, not Judaism. It's also complicated. Is it? He wrote the whole thing in a book called Moses and Monotheism. Basically, what he's saying is Moses is a sidekick, not an originator. But what's the truth? Did Moses introduce monotheism, or was it Akhenaten? And what can archaeology tell us about the birth of our belief in one God? There's the bell. Man, oh man, what a fight this is going to be. For the longest time, no one had ever heard of Akhenaten or his <gasps> legacy. What an imagination. But then, in the late 19th century, archaeologists digging the Egyptian ruin of Amarna discovered a massive cover-up. I'm sure of that. Someone had tried to bury Akhenaten in the sands of history forever. Why? Because back in the 14th century BCE, Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti tried to switch Egypt from polytheism to the belief in one god. Together we bring Egypt to all of its glory. This discovery has caused many scholars to say that Akhenaten's religion was the real inspiration for the Bible. And if Moses existed at all, he was just one of Akhenaten's followers. But why? Why does it matter? For several reasons. Look. If Moses was a follower of Akhenaten's religion, then that means Muslims, Jews, and Christians are just backdoor followers of Akhenaten. Pretty ridiculous if you ask me. Historians agree that Akhenaten inherited the throne in 1340 BCE. I know my duty. I promise. Around the same time, he married his first cousin, the legendary beauty Nefertiti. You mean everything to me. But then, five years into his reign, Akhenaten and Nefertiti converted Egypt to the belief in a sun god named Aten, which was represented by a circular golden disk. But what did the Aten symbol stand for? To find out more, I'm meeting with Michel Moran. So whenever I hear the word action, I will start. Who has written several books on Akhenaten and Nefertiti. We don't know that much about what this religion was all about. There's, there's a song, there's, a, there's an inscription that seems to be very close. There is a hymn to Aten. And in the hymn, it talks about Aten as being the mother and father of all creation, a male and female deity, which wasn't represented by either male or female, but just a disc of a sun. It's believed that Akhenaten wrote the hymn himself, and it's remarkably similar to Psalm 104 in the Bible. And speaking of the book, it wouldn't hurt you to use one sometime and check up on any points that you're not sure of. In it, he praises Aten for being the sole creator of the world and the creator of all creatures, including humankind. In fact, there seems to be many similarities between Aten and the God of Israel. Both Aten and the biblical God are singular gods that combine both male and female energies into one. Both are credited with creating light. And just like Moses taught the Israelites that their God was the only God, Akhenaten also told the Egyptians that Aten was the only God. In your name I'll bring peace and justice. You see, the pharaohs of Egypt had always been allowed to choose a God that represented them. But they would have never suggested that any of the 2,000 gods in the Egyptian pantheon were false idols. But five years into his reign, Akhenaten made a move that enraged the priest of the Amun cult, Betrayers. the most powerful group in ancient Egypt. Tell us, say what you told me. 
This was a huge and sweeping revolution that changed the people's lives entirely. Not only did they displace Egypt's old gods, but they actually moved the capital, the entire capital, to a place called Akhet Taten, and which archaeologists call Amarna, and create their entire city there dedicated to Aten. So this is like the President of the United States saying, no more Washington, we're moving... To Arizona. Yeah. I can imagine there were a lot of people not best pleased. Amarna was built in the middle of Egypt. And to get there, I have to travel by ferry south along the Nile, where the world doesn't look like it's changed all that much from Akhenaten's time. Inside the tombs at Amarna, I can't help but notice how the art and architecture are different from what I'd normally expect from ancient Egypt. Whereas most other Egyptian art includes fantastical creatures and idyllic representations of the pharaohs, there's something very human about the way Akhenaten and Nefertiti are depicted. There was a sculptor named Beck who's portraying the couples as they really were. So you have, for example, an image of Nefertiti chowing down on a huge haunch of ribs, or you have her ha one of having one of her six children playing on her lap and playing with some of the streamers coming from her crown. So what you're saying is that they revolutionized religion, they revolutionized art, they, they revolutionized family relationships. They changed everything. Absolutely everything. But, but maybe they went too fast. Anyone who tries to have a revolution too quickly is going to drown under the waters. They were definitely remembered as heretics. They are considered the heretic king and queen. Within 20 years of their reign, Akhenaten and Nefertiti were overthrown by the powerful Amun cult and possibly even murdered. You'll pay now, just as I said, with your heads. In fact, when the Amun priests took over control, they rotated all the bricks in Akhenaten's temples and painted the walls with tributes to their old gods so as to wipe the royal couple from the history books forever. Forward. But now, their story has prompted scholars to believe the Bible was inspired by Akhenaten and that Moses was just a priest in Akhenaten's temple. That's impossible. No, please. According to this theory, when the cult of Amun murdered Akhenaten and Nefertiti, Moses decided to lead an army of true believers into the Sinai Desert, taking with him all of Akhenaten's best ideas. To find out who influenced who, I'm going to have to figure out who came first, Moses or Akhenaten. It won't be long now, folks. Keys and tall tall men. Keys and tall tall men. I'm looking for evidence that can tell me who was the first to introduce the organized belief in one God. And a left, and a right. He's waiting for a chance at that famous rifle. Look out! So far, I found out that Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti championed the monotheistic religion in Egypt back in the 14th century BCE. This has caused some scholars to say that Akhenaten was the original inspiration for the biblical story of the Exodus. And the first scholar to suggest this was none other than Dr. Sigmund Freud. Freud wrote a very famous book, Moses and Monotheism, the idea that Moses was an Akhenaten follower. And when the whole Amarna period goes down, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, they're murdered. Here's this one out of work. Uh, Aten, Aten priest, Aten perhaps. Priest. He says to the slaves, hey guys, follow me. Goes to the desert, everybody's following. And essentially, Judaism is Atonism revised, mm -hmm. right? And of course, out of that flows Christianity, Islam, and everything else. I feel that there's certainly a connection between Moses and the monotheism as it was practiced by Akhenaten and the Aten worshiping. Did that influence Moses? Did that influence uh, Judaism, Christianity? It all depends on the date who's first is influencing the other guy. Yes. If Freud's right, that would mean Moses led an exodus out of Egypt exactly when Akhenaten was overthrown in 1340 BCE. But I don't buy Freud's theory at all. Let's look at it this way. My reading of the Book of Kings clearly dates the exodus to 1480 BC, 480 years before the first temple in Jerusalem was built and exactly 140 years before Akhenaten's reign. But what's interesting is that the Bible says that it took Moses and his followers exactly 40 years to cross through the Sinai Desert, 
and another hundred years to start gaining control of the land of Canaan, modern-day Israel. So if the biblical timeline is right, then I should be able to find some evidence of a conquest of Canaan going on exactly at the time of Akhenaten's reign. And it just so happens that evidence exists. They're called the Amarna letters, stone tablets that were sent to Akhenaten by desperate Canaanite kings begging him to send them help to defend against an attacking army of nomads. The old men ransack our homes and they are never punished. Now I want to find out what these Amarna letters really say. So I'm on my way to the British Museum in London to meet with curator Dr. Irving Finkel. I brought you in this tray a selection of our Amarna tablets because I know that's what you're interested in. And these are them? And these are real specimens. Well, I thought they were much bigger. Oh. I thought you'd be coming in with a, like a wheelbarrow or something. No, these are small but perfectly formed. But all these and about another 300 uh, were discovered at Slutamana by locals. It was immediately apparent, even though the script is often sometimes quite difficult, that they were letters and that they were royal letters to the king, my lord, to the king, my lord. The bulk of these letters are to do with money and politics. This is, this is a typical example of one of these letters. You, you do read this? Right? Sure, I read it. Anna Shari Belia Ilia Shamshia Kibima. So Is this amazing? He's reading a 3,400-year-old letter. I don't read English that well. The Amarna letters clearly show that Canaan was being attacked by a group of nomads called the Habiru, who had come out of the Sinai Desert and started attacking the Canaanites. Since the land of Canaan was under Egyptian protection at the time, it makes complete sense that the Canaanite kings would send Akhenaten letters pleading for his support. Lots of the letters say, I need troops, I need help, please send, please send, please send. That's understandable. Here they are, these Canaanites, they're being attacked by these Habiru people. Right. They've been sucking up to the Egyptians for a long time. And they get nothing in return. And the, the, the conventional idea is that Akhenaten is reclining on his couch, philosophizing about the structure of the universe, and there's only one god, and he can't be interested with all this stuff. And probably somebody came in and said, you know, there's a very urgent message, your highness. If I read this, it looks like there's going to be trouble. Ah, leave me alone, or something like this. The Amarna letters prove that at the time of Akhenaten's reign, a conquest of Canaan was already underway by an army of nomads called the Habiru. Can't you explain why that is so? Habiru sure sounds like Hebrew. Could Amarna's Habiru that conquered the Promised Land be the 12 Hebrew tribes that Moses led through the Sinai Desert? This has been a very enlightening visit. Kiss and talk to me. Kiss and talk to me. I want to find out who spread monotheism first, Moses or Akhenaten. I've just seen the Amarna letters in London and found out that at the time of Akhenaten's reign, a conquest of Canaan was happening that perfectly matches the conquest recorded in the Bible. The Amarna letters call the conquerors of Canaan Habiru. Who were they? I've come to the ancient city of Lachish, one of the Canaanite cities attacked by the Habiru during Akhenaten's reign. It's here that I'm meeting with Ahmed Osman, an expert in both Egyptian and biblical history. It's mentioned in the Tel Amarna letters, the letters that were written to King Akhenaten saying, help us, help us, we're being attacked. And I thought, well, Akhenaten, what better place than be in front of the city which he didn't help. Yes. In fact, he didn't help anybody. I mean, in Jerusalem and other locations in Canaan, they all wrote letters to King Akhenaten uh, asking him to help them because they were attacked by some strange uh, people called Abiro. And uh, he was not uh, interested to help them, so he didn't care. A lot of people have speculated that these Hapiru people that are mentioned in Tel Amarna letters are actually the Hebrews. Yes, I believe they were Hebrews. Not necessarily meaning Israelites, because the Israelites are one tribe of the Hebrews. So not all Hebrews are Israelites, but all Israelites are Hebrews. That's it. If you find like bagels and locks in his stomach, you'll know. You'll know, yes. Ahmed Osman believes 
that the Habiru nomads that attacked Canaan were actually Hebrews that came out of the Sinai Desert. This confirms the conquest of the Promised Land described in the Bible. You see, even though the land of Canaan had strategic importance for the Egyptians, during his reign, Akhenaten ignored the Amarna letters, and he let Canaan fall to the Hebrews, begging the question, if Akhenaten wasn't against the Hebrew conquest, could it be that he was actually for it? He's not sending the cavalry. He does not send the cavalry. In fact, he responds with requests for more glassware for his table. Thank you for telling me that you're dying. <laughs> Can you send some more glass? I really like the gold plate. What do you make of that? That's a man who is completely self-absorbed. Some people speculate that this group is the Hebrews. I speculate that in my second book. There probably is some sort of uh, association between them. But if that's the case, if he's before Moses, how can you have Hebrews at the gates in Canaan? That is a good question. People haven't figured it out, eh? No, they haven't. Since I found out that the Habiru nomads who conquered Canaan were actually Hebrews, I think I've also figured out why Pharaoh Akhenaten refused to help the Canaanites. I was looking for love, and I found it. He's a total man. He's a total man. My quest to find out who was the first to spread monotheism has taken a turn. Even though there's plenty of evidence that Akhenaten and Nefertiti did start a monotheistic revolution in Egypt... I have a great monument created for honoring you. There seems to be evidence that a Hebrew exodus from Egypt might have influenced them. You see, Akhenaten's grandfather might be able to explain everything. Akhenaten's grandpa was named Yuya. And his sarcophagus is now kept at the Cairo Museum in Egypt. Back in 1905, Yuya's mummy was found buried in the Valley of Kings, alongside the top pharaohs of Egyptian history. According to Ahmed Osman, Yuya is a Hebrew name, not an Egyptian one. You say, and you called your book Stranger in the Valley of the Kings, right? Yes. Here's this mummy of this guy named Yuya. Yes. And he was, he was the grandfather of, of Akhenaten. Yes. In the tomb, they found his name spelt in different ways. But all the names have the Y. The Yo sound. Yes. The Egyptians relate the person's name to the god he worshipped. You, I mean, you is the short of, of Yahweh or Je Jehovah. Or... Akhenaten named himself after his god, Aten. Akhenaten's father was named after the Egyptian god Amun. But Akhenaten's grandfather's name represents the god of Israel. This is the name of the god of Israel built into a name. And it's clearly not Egyptian. And you're the only guy who says, here's a guy who doesn't fit in the Valley of Kings. You're saying this Yuya guy is not Egyptian. He is from the tribe of Jacob who came from uh, Canaan, and he's an Israelite, of course. OK, now that's controversial, right? OK, look at it, examine it, and see if, if I have uh, enough evidence or not. So you're saying he, does, you know, he doesn't look like an Egyptian? No. If you look at his profile, he's, he's, he's a Semitic. He's got a big nose? Yes. He's got the Semitic good looks? Yes. OK, so bottom line about Yuya, his name tells you he's a Semite. Yes. His looks tell you he's a Semite. Yes. My search to find out whether Akhenaten's faith in one god was influenced by Moses might have just hit pay dirt. Not only did the archaeology confirm a Hebrew conquest of the Promised Land at the time of Akhenaten's reign, but now there's evidence that Akhenaten's grandfather was Hebrew too. The name Yuya suggests that both Akhenaten and Nefertiti supported the conquest of Canaan recorded in the biblical books of Joshua and Judges. The reason they supported a Hebrew conquest was because they were closet Hebrews. The patriarch of the family is known as yu -ya. I'm amazed at the utter closed-mindedness of so many Egyptologists. The, the Ya sound is the God of Israel. So if you see these guys who, whose very names reflect their belief in an Egyptian way, now we can explain why he's not reacting 
to the Canaanites. If you have a monotheist uh, uh, pharaoh, right, he's going to be supportive of the Hapiru. Because he doesn't care if it's taken over. He doesn't care. They're his ideological buddies. I think day. it's completely possible. So anyway, that's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. It's a good one. It's a good one. It right? is, actually. <laughs> it really is. So there it is. Freud was wrong. Moses wasn't a priest of Akhenaten. Akhenaten was a follower of Moses. But what might just be the smoking gun in my theory is leading me back to Amarna. You see, when archaeologists uncovered the ruins of Akhenaten's capital, they also came across the tomb of a man named Merari. Not only did Merari serve as a high priest in Akhenaten's temple, he was also Nefertiti's superintendent and, as some experts believe, Akhenaten's royal scribe. So what does Merari have to do with anything? Well, Merari is not only the name of one of the three branches of Levite priests in the Jewish faith, he's also the cousin of Moses himself. The Bible specifically says that the Merarites were priests in the tabernacle of God. Is it just a coincidence that Merari is a priest in the Bible and a priest in Akhenaten's temple? Or did Akhenaten turn to Moses' family when he needed a high priest? For me, when you add up the evidence, it shows that Akhenaten's monotheism was influenced by earlier Hebrew ideas. You know, I gotta say, the more I learn about this guy Akhenaten, the more I like him. I don't think he was the inspiration for Moses. I think he was inspired by Moses. But you know what? He was willing to put his power where his mouth is. He was willing to sacrifice everything for his beliefs. He depicted God as light. Madonna would love this guy. It's Kabbalah, little hands of warmth coming from heaven. The more I learn about him, the more I like him. He's a total man.